Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very last day of the summit of the 2022 USAID Higher Education Global Evidence Summit. My name is Jennifer LeBron, and I am the leader of the USAID Higher Education Learning Network, the HELN, which we refer to as the HELEN. I am sharing MC duties today with my colleague Samantha Alvis throughout today's program. While week one of the summit focused on innovation and week two on employability, and yesterday's program focused on private sector engagements, which are all themes drawn from the USAID Higher Education Learning Agenda, our goal for today is to have convergence. Not only will we explore the connections between these themes and what we've learned over the last three weeks, but we will also be trying to understand them through a new lens. Our sessions today will focus on higher education in crisis and conflict affected settings, as well as higher education's role in supporting democracy and student activism. These topics are both extremely timely. As we see around the world, increasing conflict and crisis brought on by violence, climate change, and other disasters, and the rise of nationalism and the threatened that have threatened freedoms and limited speech, the role of higher education as a civil society actor and a local leader in communities is so important. So our goal today will be to have these intriguing and challenging and worthwhile conversations, both with our experts who are on the screen and with you in the audience. I'm very excited for today. So before we begin this conversation, though, I do have to give you a few reminders. In the Whova platform, you can go back and view pre-recorded session content from week one and week two. You can message participants or uh, to begin new conversations or continue conversations, and you can catch up on what's been happening in the last two weeks. Additionally, all the plenary and content, uh, concurrent sessions are being recorded and will be posted to the summit website following the live event. So I encourage you to reach out to folks in the Whoville platform today if you haven't made those connections and to go back in and search through our content. There's a lot of really great sessions in there if you want to take a moment to peruse uh, after today's program. I also encourage you to actively use the chat box to comment and um, share throughout the program. And I want you to remember that closed captioning is available and you can access the captions by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Please also remember that this is a global event and not all of our participants may have the same internet connectivity. Uh, so as we feature speakers from across the globe during what is this you know, live event, um, we ask that you be patient should we lose any connections with any of our speakers or experience really any technical difficulties related to connection speeds today. And so the last thing I wanna remind you of is that at the end of today's program, we will be having the Helen launch celebration, which you can see I've already gotten into the spirit of. Um, so we're gonna have a little excitement during that session by taking a group photo with the I am the Helen uh, printout or virtual background. So you can see I already have the virtual background. You can also print out the sign and hold it up to your screen right here. Um, to find these graphics, uh, I want you to feel free to click on the link that's going to appear in the chat, um, or you can go to the agenda in the Whova app. And so you can find the session today called the Higher Education Learning Network Launch and find the link to these um, backgrounds, these uh, printouts there. So go ahead, get your background ready, get your photo ready, get your printout ready. If you can't do any of that and are technically challenged, find a piece of paper and write, I am the Helen, and you can uh, be part of our celebration in our group photo today, which I'm very excited for. And so now I would like to transition and direct our attention to our first plenary session of the day, which is focused on higher education in crisis and conflict affected settings. I am delighted to share that this presentation has come together with the support of not only the Higher Education Learning Network, the HELEN, but also with our sister network, the USAID Education in Crisis and Conflict Network, or ECCN. 
together, the Helen and the ACCN are highlighting this session as an important bridge between our higher education community and our crisis and conflict learning community. So I'm delighted that we were able to come together. And I'm also delighted that we have a fabulous uh, group of people who are here to have this conversation. And it's all being facilitated by Dr. Barbara Moser Mercer. So um, Dr. Barbara Moser Mercer is a professor emerita and founder of InZone at the University of Geneva, as well as a visiting professor at the University of Nairobi. Dr. Moser Mercer has been engaged in strengthening African solutions that advance higher education in emergencies and is currently coordinating the African Higher Education and Emergencies Network, AHEAN. I can think of no one better to lead us through today's unique session, which will help us get at the roots of higher education in crisis and conflict effect settings. And I'm really delighted to have this conversation. So Barbara, I'm gonna turn this over to you so you can help set the stage. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, welcome to everyone um, currently residing in Nairobi, uh, where it's a nice afternoon. I'm sure it's the morning in some other places and maybe later in the evening, uh, wherever you are, welcome. I, I think the task I've been given is, um, is not an easy one, uh, and I hope I can walk you through some of the challenges and with the help of uh, several uh, collaborators and this program, I'm sure uh, you will walk away with hopefully a better understanding uh, of what higher education emergencies is all about. Uh, let me try and move you uh, into this topic by just perhaps outlining how do we get from a conflict to a crisis and to an emergency. So as conflicts escalate to the level of a crisis, what ensues is a state of emergency. And quite often that is a humanitarian emergency. And if it is a humanitarian emergency, it is the humanitarian system that responds. Responding often requires a great number of actors. And uh, on this particular slide, you can actually see how uh, the humanitarian system has designed to collaborate and coordinate its response. It's the who, what, where, and how uh, that we see on the screen. In order to respond to an emergency, and this is actually where uh, the arrow is pointing to the disaster, this is where your emergency happens. Uh, in this particular uh, scenario, you have various clusters. This is the UN cluster system, and every cluster has a very particular task. And I'm not going to have the time to move you around the wheel here, but maybe I would like to point out that uh, looking at education, you can see that UNICEF and Save the Children are the two cluster leads uh, for the field of education. However, the field of education, although higher education is situated in that field, is not the only field that concerns higher education. Uh, we're equally affected and equally collaborating with the field of protection, nutrition, shelter, water, sanitation, and hygiene, logistics, health, food security, emergency telecommunications. And we are mostly situated in the phase of early recovery. So I hope this has kind of given you a bit of an overview of how the system is organized and how higher education needs uh, to collaborate uh, with the system if it is to actually do a good job. Uh, the other minor wheel that you see up there is the programming cycle. And I think I would like to point out uh, that needs assessment and analysis are the foundation of any kind of response. If you don't know what needs you have to meet, uh, there is no way you're going to be able to design a good response. And we will see later on who the actors are uh, that uh, will need to respond. In moving on to the next uh, topic um, on our next slide here, I would like to point out to you that higher education and emergencies can actually happen in a number of different settings. It all depends on where forcibly displaced populations are located. They can be in urban settings, in which case higher education institutions aren't that far away usually they are located in urban settings. And so that makes the response quite different from when 
displaced populations are in camps or in settlements. Some countries have encampment policies. All forcibly displaced uh, persons need to reside in camps and they are not allowed to reside anywhere else or outside of those camps. Now that makes for a very different kind of logistics uh, in terms of higher education institutions responding because they are not normally located in refugee camps. Uh, but youth can also be in transit. They can be on migration routes and still they would like to remain connected uh, to their educational journey. In addition to that, we can also categorize the response into response that happens in developing countries and response that happens in industrialized countries. So just from this overview, you can see there are many different um, possibilities for higher education to intervene. And the location of higher education in emergencies is thus uh, a determining factor in how we're going to respond. Now let's look at, uh, in our next slide, what uh, kind of international uh, response we have. We're not operating in a vacuum. Yeah, there is a global framework for refugee education. And let me take you back a little bit for those of you who may not have followed this since 2017, 2016, 2017, 2018, for example. Uh, you may remember there was uh, a, uh, a United Nations uh, General Assembly session where the Global Compact for Refugees was adopted as part of a report. There was also a Global Compact uh, for, um, for Safe and Orderly Migration, uh, which had been sponsored by the International Organization for Migration. But the Global Compact for Refugees is the one that really concerns us here the most. Uh, and that is why on this particular slide, you see the policy framework as it has emerged uh, since 2018, 2019. We had the first global refugee forum uh, during which pledges were being made in terms of strengthening uh, education for forcibly displaced persons, in particular refugees, uh, but also uh, internally displaced persons. And this particular strategy basically determines our, our global framework, and these are the policy frameworks uh, that we need uh, to, uh, to work with. On our next slide now, uh, we, uh, we, we can now move to uh, the kinds of concepts that have, uh, in some sense, um, gotten us to think about higher education responses. Uh, again, moving on from the legal framework, there's a set of legal frameworks, in international instruments. There's soft law, there's hard law. Uh, I've only mentioned, I only wanted to mention a few of them, but all of these are frameworks, instruments, declarations, recommendations that uh, countries, governments have signed up to. Uh, and hence countries and governments have an obligation. And since higher education institutions, especially public higher education institutions, are um, having to report uh, to governments and to the government level, to the ministry level, uh, they too are uh, in effect direct implementers uh, of these uh, soft and uh, hard law and legal, legal frameworks. Um, obviously, you know, the slide deck will be shared with you. You can go and look up uh, many of those declarations and they're very, very, very important uh, for higher education institutions to become familiar with. Uh, so that whatever response uh, is being uh, developed, uh, the response actually meets the requirements of those frameworks. In our next slide, we can see some of the topics that uh, we've all had to grapple with. And uh, I am sure that uh, the various discussions in today's session will add many, many more concepts and many more constructs uh, to this particular series. But these are just some of the key uh, concepts that higher education institutions have had uh, to grapple with in responding uh, to uh, students who've been forcibly displaced. I will just mention some of them, uh, the, the accreditation, the credentials, the recognition of your credentials, scholarships, uh, learners who are over age and no longer qualify for any kind of scholarship, the recognition of prior learning, the equation of your credentials, notarization, and I will pass at that point because we won't have enough time to go into all of this. 
Uh, in the end, I would really, really like to close uh, by uh, focusing on the learners themselves. So if we move to our last slide, uh, I would really, really want to shine the light on how do people learn in those contexts? Have you ever thought of that? What does it mean? What does it take for you as an individual to overcome the kinds of challenges that you have been faced with on either your migration route or wherever you have settled temporarily or permanently? What does it take to learn? Now, there's a great deal of science out there uh, that helps us understand how people learn. And one of the uh, most important things that we can do actually to work with our students is to better understand what it takes to learn. This slide gives you a glimpse of how the African Higher Education and Emergencies Network has approached uh, what we call social emotional well being of learners. And without going into more detail uh, on, on it, what I would like to share with you is that it is our understanding that only a student who feels good about himself or herself, who is resilient, uh, who has hope, uh, who can look into the future thinking there will be a new pathway for me, those are the kinds of students, those are the kinds of life skills that we really want uh, to help these students develop and that these students need to develop for themselves. We've combined, based on science, sports for physical well-being, applied arts, because many of the displacement contexts have very, very rich cultural traditions, as you probably know. Uh, and then we also want to focus on creativity, uh, on design thinking, on solving problems on the ground. Uh, and that is how we brought in localized engineering. So with that, I hope I've given you a snapshot uh, of um, what we will be uh, discussing today. But uh, I am obviously very, very happy to be uh, in the company of very accomplished exper experts and students uh, and, and those who have extraordinary experience in higher education and emergencies to discuss some of the main issues. Thank you very much. I would now like to uh, turn over uh, and complete this uh, presentation and give you a short introduction as to how we're going to approach uh, the various uh, topics uh, that we have prepared for you, various questions, challenges uh, that we're all ready uh, to uh, resolve uh, or at least uh, reflect on. And it's not just the discussants that uh, are joining us today, we would like to engage you as the audience as well. Uh, so we want to understand the causes and the effects uh, of problems that are related to higher education in conflict and crisis. And we will have three pre-designed trios who will engage in conversation around three topics. I'll begin by introducing very quickly each topic. Basically, I will share with you what the topic is. And then uh, we will have our three discussants uh, discuss various causes uh, of the problem that we present to you, as well as consequences uh, of that problem. And we will populate uh, a problem tree, and you've just seen an image of it uh, a moment ago. And for you as the audience, we are really inviting you uh, to take part in this discussion, to contribute from your own experience, from your own thinking. Uh, there are never any wrong answers, uh, as you know. Just share with us, uh, and uh, you will be able to do that uh, on, on a Slido. So share with us what your thinking is about the problems that we will be discussing. With that, I would now like to uh, invite our first trio to come on camera. And they will talk about the first problem statement that concerns displaced students. The problem is students displaced by conflict or crisis struggle to start, continue, or complete higher education studies with credentials that are recognized in their host countries. And it's my great, great pleasure uh, to invite to the stage uh, Grace, 
Rale and Kusai, uh, who will be our first three discussants for this particular topic. Grace, can you begin by just briefly introducing yourself and then followed by the other two discussants and then we will move into the actual discussion of the topic. Grace, over to you. You're muted, Grace, please unmute yourself. Sorry, thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you everyone who is joining. My name is Grace Mvunyi. I work for Youth Education and Sports. It's a refugee-led organization that operates from Kakuma and Dadaab and also Kalobeye. I'm in charge of the social emotional learning coordinator, which is comprised of the cross-cutting, uh, you know, cross-cutting electives that involves engineering, uh, you know, sports, sports and uh, applied arts. Um, I'm currently based in Dadaab, and it's my pleasure to be here today and to share my expertise and knowledge on, you know, what is this that, you know, hinders a refugee or displaced student from continuing or from, you know, uh, continuing with the education and even graduating from the education within the host countries. Thank you very much, Papra. Thank you, Grace. Over to you, Vale, please. Yeah, Introduce yourself uh, briefly, please. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Wally Samuel. I'm the new uh, Africa Regional Coordinator for the Learning Hub. So the Learning Hubs, of course, would um, walk around three uh, networks or three themes, if you like. Uh, the Early Grade Reading Network, uh, the Higher Education Learning Network, which we have now, and of course, the, uh, the Crisis and Conflict uh, uh, Network. Uh, of course, the hub is uh, hosted with uh, the Education Development uh, Center. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wale. Uh, over to you, Kasai. Over to Jordan. We're moving continents. <laughs> um, thank you, Professor Barbara. Um, so my name is Kasai uh, al Um I work um, as a volunteer at uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council um, in as a refugee camp in Jordan as a career coach. Um, yeah, I have a bachelor's degree in uh, management information systems. Thank you. Thank you, Kusai. All right. So first of all, thank you for being here. I know it's not been easy to connect everyone from those different locations that are not always high connectivity, as we know. Um, but let's begin uh, and ask you what you believe are the root causes for the problem that I have just stated above. Uh, and as we talk, I will invite the audience to add what cause they would like to add to our problem tree using the Slido link. Kusai, would you like to get the conversation going? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, as a cause of, the, of this problem, I can see that um, the difference in requirements um, for access, uh, accessing higher education uh, might be a big, um, a big cause for this problem. Um, as an example, um, the language uh, proficiency test um, is required by um, most of the university. But um, the requested score um, varies um, widely. So that might be a problem which leads to, to the effect, which is that many of students um, couldn't meet the requirements to access um, higher education. Also, as um, there's no global system for higher education, um, the educational system in the country of um, origin for the refugee uh, will probably be different uh, than that in the refuge country. So um, it, it's going to be a big problem for students to get all the requirements to, to continue their um, higher education in the refuge country. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think this is really one of the fundamental, uh, uh, you know, causes. We'll, we'll just stick to the causes for the first round and then we'll move on to the consequences of the causes. But maybe I can turn it over to Grace and uh, Grace can also, uh, you know, from her own experience, uh, mention what kinds of causes uh, she can think of in terms of this problem. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you everyone in terms of the courses. Uh, we are talking about unrecognized credentials in the host countries, whereby, you know, refugees or displaced learners come from their countries with foreign uh, credentials. And so it becomes very hard for them to be, you know, to be enrolled into the host countries because the credentials are not recognized. And even if we talk about translations of those credentials and the certificates that they, they, they come with from their host countries, it becomes hard because then that means there's a lot of money that is involved in, you know, translation. And uh, it's also, you know, even the acceptance of that credential becomes a big issue. Uh, we also have another course uh, that is based on, you know, competing family responsibilities, whereby you are a learner in a refugee context or in, uh, you're in a displaced context, but you have this other, you know, you have to, um, you're having to, uh, you know, to work through your learning, you know, to, to work through your education, but also to make sure that your family you know, you sustain the family. So that's about, uh, you know, checking out after your siblings or if you're a parent, that means you're, you're having to learn, but also having to work so that your family can be sustained. But it's also about for, for, for women who are, you know, you are a student, you are a worker, there is work that is also waiting for you at home, like the home chores and all that. So it becomes very hard to balance between family responsibilities and you as a student. Um, there's also an issue of power and internet connectivity. We really have a big challenge with power and internet connectivity within the refugee context, which makes it very difficult for student or displaced learners to continue with education within the host countries. We are talking of bad weathers. Um, for those ones who've been in the refugee context of, or, or maybe you've watched or maybe seen what is happening in the refugee context, the, the weathers are very bad, especially when it rains. It becomes very difficult for a learner to, you know, to access the learning center or the learning hub for them to continue with the, with the education. So even studying at home becomes an issue again because there's no power, there's no connectivity. So that's a really big challenge. And there's this, um, you know, not final, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's also an issue, the language barrier. So you are from a Francophone speaking country and you are in an Anglophone speaking country and you have to, you know, to continue the, your education, maybe in English while you, you are studying in, in French. So it becomes very, very difficult to continue in a foreign language, which you're not used to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Grace, uh, for these rich contributions of causes. And you can clearly see Grace, could just go on and on and on about a lot of the causes that she has experienced herself, uh, in, including, I think she spoke with authority about family obligations uh, that I think especially fall on women. Um, but over to uh, Vale, um, keen to hear from you about causes. Could you unmute yourself, please? So, yeah, thanks. So I want to take it from the root cause, uh, which of course we know is uh, the mismanagement of uh, social cohesion. I mean, leading to displacement. So if governments were able to manage uh, some of these uh, social issues, we wouldn't in the first instance be talking about uh, uh, displacements, uh, which perhaps is the barrier, you know, to accessing higher education. Uh, we have already issues around uh, discriminations, we have issues around uh, the climate change is huge, you know, displacing uh, a lot of uh, 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 communities and of course, uh, creating access to uh, education. And now at uh, a lower level within, uh, maybe if the displaced people are housed in the, the, in the camps or in the host communities, you have uh, uh, a, a kind of a new strain on already overboarding the infrastructure, educational infrastructure. So before even the displaced uh, people came around, you had uh, a lot of uh, university communities uh, who already have uh, a very uh, high carrying capacity, you know, in terms of uh, infrastructure. But now you now have a new host of uh, uh, displaced people coming there and that now adds to the body. And of course that is a great, uh, uh, issue relating to, to access. So these are the issues I think uh, uh, I, I personally see at the root of it is bad governance. And then you go lower, you have this issue of uh, uh, overburdened facilities, you know, in 
uh, already existing in the host communities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vale. Uh, really, thank you for taking us uh, all the way down to, to the, the, the very, very root uh, and below the root even uh, of you know why uh, there is even a need for higher education emergencies or why emergencies even arise. I would suggest, uh, let's take a look at the Slido. Let's see what the audience has to say about uh, some of those causes. Maybe we can uh, take a look at that. Um, we have attitudes by receiving institutions. In, oh, we already get an effect, but uh, disruptions of education services due to hazards, climate, natural conflict, and violence, yes, uh, cause no recognition of prior learning or learning beyond a transcript. Um, systems for evaluating previous learning at the secondary and tertiary levels are evaluated differently across institutions. Language barriers, yes. Lack of time to pursue education due to needing to meet basic needs of water, food, and shelter. Right. Uh, lack of flexibility in admissions processes in host countries. Lack of reciprocity of recognition of prior credentials. Lack of absorptive capacity in host country higher education systems. Narrow ideas of quality and what is accepted. Language barriers again. Transport to the higher education institutions. Okay. Uh, these are absolutely you know, fantastic contributions. And I can see there's just so much coming in, rich contributions, access to past credentials, no electronic repository for credentials, students like proof of prior education credentials. I think this is coming through time and again, and certainly, you know, we definitely have to add that to the tree. Uh, the lack of a global credential system, that might be uh, one that we could definitely uh, put up on the tree. Um, I think from personal experience and, you know, maybe uh, Grace can bear me out on that, transport to the higher education institution uh, is an important, or to the learning hub, uh, is an important problem. Uh, so maybe, you know, we can upvote that as well, but we're not going to lose any of the other fantastic contributions that came from the audience. Keep it up. Uh, there are a number of other opportunities for you to contribute, but I'm absolutely delighted uh, to see you participate so actively in this. Now, we can already have a snapshot of where we are at uh, with the tree. Uh, and while that tree is being uh, given some more branches, uh, uh, no, some more roots, I'm sorry, uh, we will move on actually uh, to talking about some of the effects of the important consequences uh, of the causes that uh, our trio has already shared. So maybe we can go back again. Um, Grace, would you like to get us going again and maybe talk about the consequences um, that, uh, you know, ensue um, now that we have found a large number of causes? Over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, among the many causes uh, which um, really comes as um, as consequences are uh, the the if uh, increased rate of dropout. There's really increased rate of dropout. We have you know many of the student being enrolled, but now the number of those ones who are dropping out is really becoming very hard, very very uh, you know increased based on the courses that we mentioned. There's also less competent in the labor market because um, you know we're talking of students who have who are doing diplomas or who are doing degrees just for a year and they drop out. So you see, they become less competent when it when it becomes to labor market or employment opportunities. Um, there's also increased level of criminal activities within the refugee context and you know, within the displaced context, because, you know, now, now this is a person who has, uh, you know, dropped out and they have nothing to do, they have no activities to work on. And, um, you know, through education is when somebody, you know, you know, um, education removes that um, um, mentality of doing any criminal activity. So the moment you stop going to school or the moment you drop out, you lose the focus of what humanity really is. So it's not even about employment alone, but it's also about learning to be human. So losing that, you know, that momentum of being, a, being in school or being in an institution, you become like a criminal. So there's increased level of criminal activities. Uh, and, and we are talking of drug abuse, we're talking of, you know, um, uh, other criminal activities like uh, involving themselves into, uh, you know, explosions and, you know, all that. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Grace, for you know bringing us back, you know, to one of the key mandates of higher education. It's really, you know, developing or helping develop, uh, helping humans develop uh, into into you know uh, human beings that are you know educated that uh, can you know critically reflect on the state of the world and can contribute uh, to making the world a better place. So thank you for connecting us back. So especially important when we're talking about conflict and crisis and emergencies. Yeah. Um, Kosai, could you uh, share some of the consequences uh, with us? Um, yeah, actually, um, um, the need for a global system um, for, for higher education um, is now um, very important for, for every refugee around the world. So, um, for example, for me, um, as a personal experience, um, I came to, uh, to Jordan. Um, I was in uh, Damascus University. I come here. Um, the Jordanian universities does, uh, did not recognize um, what I have passed in, the, um, in, the, in Damascus University. Um, also, um, for what uh, Grace had um, said about, um, let's say, the um, recognition. Um, for example, I got a um, bachelor degree uh, via Amity University, uh, which is um, an online university in India, but it's, uh, it's not recognized in Jordan. So I can, I can do nothing with this certificate. Yeah, so um, the need for a global system is really um, uh, critical. Thank you. Yeah, because I, I, I really hear you uh, because, I mean, knowing Kosai personally, knowing that he's put in so many years of hard learning to get this bachelor's degree, and then to find out that it actually does not help him advance in the host country. Um, I. I I don't, I just want you to imagine that if you were in Kasai's shoes, what would be your reaction? And to see Kasai as resilient as he is, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, our, our, our congratulations to you for actually critically reflecting on this issue and pointing it out. And hopefully with this global conversation, uh, we can move the needle uh, towards a global system. Vale. Can I turn it over to you? And yeah, all the way the audience can contribute to the Slido, I'm keen to see you know, additional consequences. Please, yeah, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to take it from where, I mean, what I offered in terms of uh, the courses. So uh, the more the um, host community education system is uh, overloaded, the more you have increased rate of uh, uh, attrition, student attrition, uh, the more you have uh, even low retention as well. And of course, um, education in itself has an end and the end of education itself is to uh, in improve the overall uh, citizenry and the well-being of the, of the individual. So within the camps, within the host communities, when you have very low access to education, those students who are supposed to serve as role models to all the kids, uh, you just don't have the kind of uh, uh, population anymore to build uh, the resilience of the other kids. So what do you have? You're gonna have more, you know, more of the loosening of the social fabric in the system. So you're gonna likely gonna have uh, increased uh, drug addiction, a lot of violence. And so to me, this is a very serious issue. And that's why a lot of attention uh, needs to be paid uh, to uh, the issue of education, higher education in, in the conflict and crisis setting. Thank you. Thank you, Wale. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so impressed, you know, with all the consequences that you've mentioned and uh, our fairies in the background are populating our problem tree, uh, but let's go and look at the audience. Uh, let's see, you know, the rich contributions uh, that are coming in on the Slido and see what kinds of effects has our audience been thinking of. We got language barrier can lead to discontinuation. 
funding may meet only basic needs that exclude education. Oh yes, we can subscribe to that. Uh, second class citizens in host countries, indeed generational loss, feelings of failure, invisibility and powerlessness in an unjust system, lack of job opportunities that require credentials, social frustration and deteriorating mental health of individuals, families and communities, mismatch between higher education and employability in a host country, and students feel disheartened or defeated. Yeah, that brings us back, you know, to the social emotional well being uh, and the importance of it. The importance of facilitating youth access to higher education must be emphasized in the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda. Yes, uh, the Sustainable Development uh, Goal 84 is somewhat silent uh, on this. I totally agree. Uh, overwhelmed or intolerant host community higher education institutions lags or gaps between education enrollment in the home sending country and resettlement context. Oh no, it looks like we've lost Barbara for a moment. So I'm hoping she comes back briefly. Let's take a look at the problem here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step into Barbara's shoes. I cannot fill them at all, but as we're waiting for Barbara to come back, Chrisai, Grace, and Wally, if you can forgive me from intruding in your conversation, let's take a look at the uh, problem tree. And we can see that it's already being filled out um, with great, with great additions, I'm seeing additional causes, additional problems that are being filled in. So thank you for our producers in the background who are working towards this. So we're adding suggestions and Barbara's back. So I have filled the time and I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Yes, I live in Kenya. So connectivity <laughs> can be interrupted from time to time. I'm not seeing Barbara. Okay, so we've taken a look at the suggestions in the Slido. I think we've added a couple of these to our tree. And I think, is there any final thoughts or words that we have from the ground our running, so to speak? Discussants. So thank you very much. And I'd like now like to actually invite our next trio onto the screen. So I'd now like to welcome uh, three more discussants uh, who will be dealing with a new problem. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Priscilla Ndegwa from Kenyatta University. I'd like, also like to welcome uh, Erin Ruiz uh, from Erin Ruiz Consulting. Uh, I would like to welcome Sharia uh, Kibria from Texas A&M University. Uh, those uh, three experts uh, will be working with us on the problem statement number two. And you, it is, you can see it now on the screen, higher education institutions that lack the governance structures and our expertise to operate in settings of prolonged conflict, struggle to continue to serve their students, often straddling the requirements of Okay, so we're gonna wait for Barbara to come back and Barbara, maybe, unfortunately, we might not be able to see your face. Maybe we can have you turn off your camera to help us keep your connectivity and, and be here with us. But as Barbara was saying, um, 
The problem is higher education institutions lack governance structures and their expertise to operate in settings of prolonged conflict, and they struggle to continue to serve their students, often straddling the requirements of operating in humanitarian contexts and the requirements of academia. So let's start with an introduction of our panel. Uh, so uh, maybe, Erin, uh, why don't you begin? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and give us a brief introduction to who you are? Sure. Hi, my name is Erin Bleese. I'm currently based in Canada, and I consult focus on education and displacement context, but come from a lot of experience in the field, um, working in refugee context, particularly in the Middle East and East Africa. Wonderful. Thank great. You. Yeah, so I'll take over again. I don't okay, know uh, why it keeps kicking me out. Uh, so I apologize for uh, the shifting. Uh, but thank you, Jennifer, for backing me up. Um, let's turn it over to Priscilla. Could you quickly introduce yourself, please? And okay, you thank you, Babla. Yourself. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, Babla. Hello, everyone. My name is Priscilla Degwa. I'm a faculty member of Kenyatta University. Kenyatta University, for those who are not familiar with it, is one of the biggest uh, public university in Kenya. It's located in the outskirts of Nairobi City. Uh, currently, I'm the coordinator of Kenyatta University Adapt Center. This is a center that coordinates refugee studies and empowerment programs, mainly at Kakuma and Adab. I've been at the center for close to eight years now, and this has enabled me to gather experiential knowledge on higher education in emergencies. My continuous interactions with different actors in this field has always put me in a better position to understand factors affecting higher education in emergencies. And uh, from that experience, I'm going to share the discussion of today. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Over to you, Sharir. And please unmute yourself. We won't be able to hear you uh, otherwise. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Barbara. My name is Sharir Kibria. I'm at Texas a &M University College Station. I teach here, and of course, um, I work at the Center on Conflict and Development. I have experience working um, in conflict-prone areas, uh, namely Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan, um, and other places of Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll use that experience to uh, hopefully possibly contribute to this discussion, laying down that causes uh, and effects. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we've got uh, a team of experts here, and uh, I would now like to uh, to ask uh, whoever would like to go first uh, to start with the causes. How would you uh, see the causes of the problem that we have uh, placed in front of you? Erin, would you like to start? Sure, I can go ahead. Uh, just to put it very briefly, I think a huge cause is that this is not an original purpose of higher education institutions. Meaning it was not an original purpose of higher education institutions to operate in a refugee context or in a humanitarian context. Uh, you look back at traditional purposes of higher education institutions, they were to pursue knowledge, um, through research, through training, uh, and <clears throat> often from a government side of like, what is best for this nation? What do we need our, our population to know so that we can have the labor market to do it, et cetera. At the same time, humanitarian actors were never designed to be higher education providers. So you have this discrepancy of what happens in a refugee or humanitarian context, what, how do we move forward if you want to, Barbara very clearly showed like different places where learners need or individuals would like to pursue or continue their education. But if humanitarian actors are not set up to do it and higher education institutions, it not used to operating in this context, there's a learning, uh, curve that needs to happen in attention between these, these two actors. So that's a, a root cause that I have, that I see. Great, Erin. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I think that's a very, very important uh, you know, observation in terms of um, conflicting mandates 
Uh, yeah, one mandate does not necessarily match uh, the mandate of the other. And trying to design and develop that interface, I think, has really, really been uh, one of the big challenges that we've been trying to confront here uh, in, uh, in Africa. But over to you, Sharir. Um, let's hear from you how you see the causes. Thank you, Barbara. I would like to build on what Aaron said. And I would like to say that HEIs, the higher education institutions have constrained government structure and a very conservative approach uh, that comes from uh, say higher education institutions are often either they're considered or they're under state or federal agencies that are subject to strict government rules. And those rules are not similar to uh, aid agencies or humanitarian organizations. Now, private universities also receive funding and abide by rules prepared by the legislative assemblies. So as such, higher education institutions cannot operate like NGOs, bilateral and multilateral like agencies that can survive or thrive during challenging times. Uh, in addition to that, I'd say that uh, higher education institutions prioritize the safety and security of their stakeholders, students, and faculty first. So in a sense, um, drawing um, or complementing Aaron's point, higher education institutions are not built like, say, for example, Red Cross. So while um, it is it is important to understand, and I have worked through my frustration in Afghanistan, Iraq, South Sudan, DRC, that we really try to assist and we understand and recognize that life goes on during times of conflict or challenges. But it is very difficult uh, to do that uh, from a university setting and within the bounds of uh, the setting of both the host government and, of course, uh, the uh, governments that are initiating this process. Well, thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you for uh, you know those observations. Uh, definitely, you've lived through them. Uh, I can tell the frustration still. Uh, you know, is quite obvious uh, in how you. Uh, describe them and that you've tried to resolve some of them and you know we've all come up against barriers so let's hope that this conversation will actually also help uh, you know put them uh, front and center and that uh, we hopefully you know we'll see uh, the needle move uh, let's move on to Priscilla Priscilla how, how do you see the causes for this particular problem statement yes thank you Babla I want to contribute to three causes uh, in a row and uh, one cause is the lack of adequate advocacy for the roles that have been put in place to support education in emergency at tertiary level. Uh, you realize that there are laws to, in place to support education in emergencies, but uh, however, you find that management of running institutions are not keen to implement the laws due to the fact that they are not guided, they are guided by formal structures within which they provide regular education. And because of this, strong advocacy may be required to create awareness and even to persuade them to incline their structures towards creating capacity for higher education in emergencies. Uh, another cause is um, that there, there is always a conflict between higher education institution requirements and donor policy on admission and completion. Uh, you find that uh, those who are operating in the uh, crisis and conflict context uh, you find that majority of the population suffering from conflicts are hosted in the countries in the south of the globe. And most donors happen to channel their funds to these countries in support of access to higher education for them. However, higher institutions in the south and notably in Africa, where like uh, we operate, have tight admission criteria, which most of the refugees do not meet for varied reasons related to the context they find themselves in. So you, you find that uh, whereas the donor may expect that the universities will not have restrictions in admitting the students, uh, you find that the, the universities are guided by
by some formal structures that guide the criteria of admitting the students. So if I, that majority of them uh, fail to access uh, higher education. Another cause is a lack of administrative structures to discuss and implement higher education in emergencies for collaboration approach among the higher education uh, actors and players. Uh, you find that uh, there, there, there is lack of these administrative structures in uh, higher institutions that would provide that platform for higher education players to discuss and even collaborate in the implementation of higher education in emergencies. As a result, you find that many players and even potential collaborators find themselves lacking proper channels to provide higher education to those in crisis and conflict situations. You find that there are many uh, collaborators and uh, players in the North would want to participate in this, but you find that there are not such platforms and structures to enable them to collaborate with the, uh, with, with the universities in the South of the group. Thank you, Babla. Yeah, thank you, Priscilla. I, I, I think, you know, we've got, again, a set of very, very uh, rich uh, contributions on the causes of the problem. Uh, let's just take a look at what the audience provided us with, uh, and you know what what they are contributing uh, to this uh, to this particular um, problem statement. Maybe I can ask uh, for some support uh, to read those off, <laughs> as I am not uh, necessarily in a position to access them quite quickly now. Oh, there they are. Good. So we have, uh, it is not part of higher education purpose or goals. Higher education institutions are often the first to be targeted or weakened in conflict, yes. Uh, it's basically education under attack. Uh, and we have that both, you know, at, uh, we have that actually across the entire education spectrum from uh, early childhood, primary, secondary, up all the way to higher. Um, conflict can be accompanied by closing spaces where institutional autonomy and academic freedom are eroded. I would definitely like to upvote that cause uh, and put it on our problem tree. It's one that hadn't come out yet, uh, and I think it should be uh, included. Uh, we have faculty that are ill-prepared. Yes, um, I would also like to upvote that one. Um, further, we have language barriers, funding uh, issues. Uh, we've already talked about the donors and the donor priorities. So let's go back um, as we continue to collect, uh, of course, these very rich contributions from the audience and none of your contributions will be lost. Uh, we will document them all and archive them all and uh, work with them in future. Uh, it's such a, it's really, really so great to see your very active contributions uh, in, in this session. But let's move over to the consequences. Maybe, uh, yeah, we can take a quick look at the tree again. Uh, it's getting increasingly populated. But now let's uh, go back. Uh, and maybe, Erin, if you can get us started again on the effects. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. And it's really fascinating to hear all of these uh, effects. And some one of my reflections is that some of the causes actually cause other causes so that they're they're kind of building on each other but one of the effects i'm seeing is these competing priorities and we kind of see some of them happening in the causes but that when you have things in direct competition with one another and priscilla mentioned it 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 makes it difficult for a higher education institution or the structure of it to operate one example that I that I hear coming out and, that, and I've witnessed is, for example, to admit refugee students that might not have, as uh, Grace talked about, their transcripts or recognize that a university might have to lower their entrance standards. Now, this is in direct conflict with a university that says we want to have high entrance requirements or high standard to operate. And so immediately the structure is challenged. Another one is that I've also witnessed is an admission system that says, well, we have to follow this certain protocol of admitting a student. Like we need their photo, we need their address, we need all this information. 
And then that is in direct conflict of refugee protection law. And so without clear mandates of how to operate and without a un this kind of a university being a humanitarian actor or understanding all of that, you start seeing these things come at the very basic structures before learning even occurs, um, kind of breaking it up and making the learning difficult to happen. Yeah, thank you, Erin. And thank you for putting your finger on some of the nitty gritty obstacles that nobody really thinks of when they are not necessarily working on the ground. Yeah, when, when you're far away in your ivory tower and you are basically implementing a higher education program, you don't really see what really allows for learning to happen. Uh, and something as very simple as a badge that has a photo on it can become a major obstacle. But without the badge and without the photo, refugees may not be allowed in a learning hub because there might be a security barrier uh, there as well. So over to Sharir, uh, over to you, please. Uh, what are some of the consequences that you can see thank for this problem? Thank you, thank you. Um, so again, I'm, I'm following Aaron and uh, an anonymous person just wrote that higher education institutions are not nimble enough. So basically summarizing what I said, and I'd like to harp on that point. Consequence is that uh, it, Sometimes they, they cannot change or they're unable to change the rigid governance structure. And due to that, it becomes very difficult in terms of refugee admission or accommodating people who feel conflict zones in their core systems. Be it uh, the courses start at a certain time or be it there are certain rules and regulations and um, they have to provide certificates and all of that. Um, I've worked with uh, uh, Afghans who just came in that worked with me in projects and it was very challenging to admit them here at Texas A&M and uh, get uh, the university the understanding that what kind of difficulty that they're going through. And at times they're going through difficulty at home as well and it, it, it's while the way that the universities are structured, it's very difficult to address those issues. Along those lines, as I said, um, due to their difficult structure and prior priorities, it's very difficult and oftentimes impossible uh, to put other faculty members or students on the ground to effectively collaborate with uh, universities in conflict prone areas. And I feel that we're also unable to conduct actionable research in active conflict zones with students and faculties due to uh, these uh, severe restrictions. And uh, while I understand that that's a mandate that uh, uh, higher education institutions need to adhere to, but it oftentimes becomes challenging and I feel that we're not pushing the boundary enough. Indeed, Sharir, thank you very much, uh, you know, for uh, again, highlighting uh, the fact that higher education institutions are kind of rigid. Uh, and I mean, there's a reason for that, uh, we're sure, but I think in the day and age of uh, speaking about inclusion, uh, I, I think, you know, higher education institutions do need to get the message uh, that inclusion doesn't happen without uh, some compromises. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Priscilla uh, and complete the consequences. And then we're, of course, keen to see what the audience has contributed in the meantime. Priscilla, over to you. Okay, thank you, Babla. Uh, as I've said earlier, we find that the universities do not have structures to support higher education in emergencies. As a result, they also do not allocate resources for that. So you find that there are, there are no resources that are allocated for higher education in emergencies. And of course, that would mean that uh, those who are in conflict and crisis area are not able to access higher education. They are not able to meet their expense for education, of course, because of their circumstances. 
And when this is not provided for, either by the government or through the university themselves, uh, you find that it becomes a problem for them to access. Again, because of those restrictive rules and uh, policies that are put in place for higher education, uh, the access to education becomes uh, a problem. Due to their circumstances, you find that um, the, the, the people, the children that are in those conflict and crisis context, they do not perform very well, not out of their own making, but because of the circumstances they find themselves in. And as a result of the policies that are put in place, quite stringent, the rules, you find that the prob there's a problem of access to higher uh, education. And again, the dropout is also very high. Uh, that is something that had been mentioned by Grace. The drop dropout become very high because again, for continuation purposes, there are also rules and regulations that are guiding how you proceed through the system at the university. So again, it become a problem uh, when many of them, even after enrolling in uh, university education, they continue dropping out. Sometimes we find that you may enroll a, a quite a, a sizable class, but uh, by the end of the program, you only have a, a few of them. I believe that the, the, the structures are really a problem. Uh, to access and also to contribution right. in education. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Let's very swiftly go uh, over to audience contributions before we move on to our last uh, problem statement. Let's see what our audience has been reflecting on. Uh, and these institutions that worry about seen as poor quality if they operate in humanitarian spaces. Excellent. Yes, yes, let's upload that one. Um, the increasing interest in the issue of university governance and the fact that its foundations and mechanisms are among the modern concepts at the global level in general, and at the local level in particular, awareness of these concepts and their applications leads to achieving a great deal of transparency and justice and helps the university administration to play its main role in facing the challenges it faces. Uh, yeah, that's that's quite a long statement. I, for, for me, I, I, I kind of feel like, could we also put it this in a nutshell and saying it's a university as a social actor uh, and it's it's responsibilities change as times change uh, and it needs to adapt to those new responsibilities uh, lack of flexible policies yes higher education uh, institutions worried about misstepping or being a bad actor in humanitarian situations yes it's good you know it's good to be worrying about these things um, but I, maybe, you know, what we should also tell higher education institutions, you are places of learning and anyone can learn about the humanitarian system and how it operates. Yeah, there, there's no, there's really no limit. Uh, so why have higher education institutions resisted learning about the humanitarian space? I, I think that that's uh, something I, I yeah, I, I would like also to see on our problem tree, uh, you know, what what's prevented them from learning? Um, then governance processes address multiple dimensions of the institution, um, how its parts are cohesive, how they exercise authority, how they communicate with internal members, students and faculty. Yes, I mean, those are indeed real, more causes than, uh, of difficulties than consequences, I would say. Um, but a lot, I think, has to do with universities not necessarily having taken the time and the effort to study up uh, on what it means to become partially a humanitarian actor. So thank you so much. Again, we will document all of this and nothing will get lost, um, but I really would like to thank our second trio for your rich contributions and we'll move over and we'll look at the tree again. It's getting increasingly uh, colorful and um, populated. So thank you so much, Priscilla, Aaron, and Sharir for your contributions. We'll now invite the last uh, trio uh, to the stage. This will be Jennifer, Valerie, and Josephine. Um, our last problem, yes, Valerie from the University of California, Davis, Jennifer DeBoer uh, from Purdue University, and Josephine Gidome from Kenyatta University. A very warm welcome. Uh, to our last trio, uh, our last problem statement uh, that they are going to discuss is conflict or crisis affected countries and regions that were not able to maintain higher education for their citizens 
struggle to find the technical and leadership skills required for the workforce to rebuild. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Can I ask you to briefly introduce yourselves and maybe Valerie, you could go first and introduce yourself and then we'll just go around. Yeah, my name is Valerie Lima and um, I'm a third year at UC Davis and I'm here representing Article 26 Backpack. And um, this is a form that allows people, young people to plan and structure their higher education and it provides them a safe way um, to store all their necessary materials to share with university and scholarship agencies and even employers. Great, a very warm welcome to you, Valerie. Jennifer, over to you. Hi, my name is Jennifer DeBoer. Um, I'm an associate professor in engineering education with a courtesy appointment in mechanical engineering uh, at Purdue University. And my research group focuses on the ways that communities uh, can teach and learn uh, engineering and technical skills to solve problems in their own environments and advance development. So I'm particularly interested in the um, technical skills side of this question. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. For those of you who joined the session early on, you uh, will have noticed that uh, our social emotional learning uh, component has an engineering component, and now you see the initiator uh, in action. So we're keen to hear from you. Josephine, over to you. Dr. Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Hi, everyone. My name is Josephine Gitome. I am a senior lecturer in Kenyatta University in the Department of uh, Philosophy and Religious Studies. Uh, I'm also a former director of the Center for Refugee Studies and Empowerment in Kenyatta University, uh, a position which is now currently occupied by the previous presenter, Dr. Priscilla Ndegwa. And uh, currently I'm also involved in research uh, in the area of higher education in emergencies, uh, particularly dealing with the issues to do with access retention and completion, and also training needs assessment uh, in the various areas, uh, sector of employ employment. Uh, I also get interested with the, or rather I'm interested on the gender issues pertaining performance in higher education. Thank you, Barbara. Great, Josephine. And while you have the floor, you can keep the floor. Could you get us started uh, on our causes? of the problem uh, and we have read the problem statement. So yeah. over to you. Yes, as you have mentioned about the countries that have gone to conflict and crisis, definitely there is this uh, breakdown of operations. You find that, that nothing is working. This breakdown of higher education infrastructure and therefore there's no more training uh, there's no more, nothing is happening. So definitely we expect that uh, consequently uh, we'll have a problem. Uh, secondly, the migration of resettlement and resettlement of uh, uh, the, the trained population. Normally when people go away because of conflict, they all go. And uh, more often than not, it is possible that those who are qualified will get resettled in the countries they go to and may not consider coming back when the country gets resettled. Uh, so that is another problem. The third one is that uh, the country as it reforms or resettles, it has very many competing interests. And uh, of particular concern to us is the higher education. It will not be uh, considering higher education as a priority uh, before they have dealt with primary, second, primary and secondary school education, because that is uh, what is actually easily managed and uh, sustained. But when you talk of uh, technical training, it comes with more challenges. So uh, a researching nation, will definitely deal with, deal with the basic education uh, first. So that is it. Back to you. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Josephine. Um, maybe I'll turn it over to Valerie. Some more causes. Yeah, um, I definitely want to reiterate what Josephine said about skilled workers fleeing the area. Um, that is a huge 
cause as they have um, the opportunity and the ability and the resources to move. And um, another cause I would like to add to the tree is with the breakdown of the structures, like Josephine said, there are a lack of opportunities to learn a new skill. And so that also will contribute um, to it being difficult for people to learn these new skills um, for the workforce to continue to rebuild. Great. Jennifer, over to you. Yes, and I uh, would build on uh, what both of the previous presenters have said specifically um, in the area of engineering and technical skills. Uh, both a cause and effect of not of having infrastructural breakdowns is um, a, a greater obstacle to building engineering and technical skills within um, uh, the, the country that's affected, as well as then a larger need for um, uh, technical um, uh, rebuilding. Uh, a couple other, I think, very relevant causes um, are uh, some of the issues that we've heard in the previous discussions, a misalignment in either the training, recognition, uh, accreditation, or transfer um, within or between countries of uh, skill development. There are very different systems for recognizing and accrediting technical skills, and often these are um, quite rigid, um, and some of the most uh, rigid disciplinary structures for accreditation. And so that makes transfer very difficult. Um, I would say um, another cause uh, is uh, disruptions that happen during conflict or crisis to internal, external labor markets and supply chains, which then result in, for example, um, uh, in uh, some of our projects in Jordan, we see that there's a need for um, uh, technical skills along the entire kind of chain of um, uh, of, of work. Uh, uh, engineers are graduating and not having uh, any employment opportunities, while at the same time there's a huge need for skilled technicians. So this mismatch um, in what the labor market actually needs for um, uh, a country that's uh, uh, having to uh, respond to a number of different forces. And last, I would say one of the most challenging causes that I see in this area is an understandable and um, really uh, important focus on primary and secondary education. So this goes back even to what Wale said about the, the role of higher education as an aspiration, um, as a demonstration of role models, as building a larger social, um, a socially cohesive ecosystem. And while primary and secondary education are important, they're often not where engineering and other technical skills are, are fostered. So I think we both need to bring those technical skills down into the primary and secondary pathways to, to build that out. Uh, but that's one of the root causes that uh, is being missed right now. Great, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. And, and also, uh, you know, for really emphasizing the important link between higher education in emergencies uh, and the rebuilding and reconstruction uh, effort. Uh, and I, I, I think, Many, many higher education institutions have serious difficulties in making their programs relevant to the labor market. I think, you know, we hear this everywhere. Yeah, that higher education institutions just, you know, haven't quite been able uh, to, to make that transition uh, to understand what is really demanded in the labor market. Now, in their defense, I should say that the labor markets are changing faster than you know, anything that we, you know, have ever seen, and that the skills uh, that are required in the labor market are also changing much faster. However, uh, I, I think the challenge is still out there. Uh, and the challenge is, is, is magnified in an emergency context. And if you can remember the slide that I showed about the humanitarian programming cycle, uh, you know, we're now in recovery. Yeah, we're talking about the recovery phase now. Uh, this is, you know, the, the, the main part where higher education, you know, is in emergencies is going to be operational. Um, but as Jennifer pointed out, and as I always ask humanitarians, I said, so what would you do in primary and secondary education if there were no higher education? So how would you operate your primary schools, your secondary schools in emergencies? It wouldn't happen. So I, I think, you know, there, there, we really need to have that conversation. Uh, and, and, and make it clear that higher education is absolutely vital uh, and that in emergencies and the humanitarian context, 
there is no way we can guarantee education in emergencies without higher education in emergencies. But let's see what the audience has to say. Uh, let's move over and uh, look at their contributions of causes, and then we'll move on to the consequences. Right. So politics and who is managing the restoration of a country. Very good. Yes, yes, yes. That also brings me to, uh, you know, what is called the humanitarian development nexus, meaning all humanitarian action, especially during the recovery phase, but even prior to that, should have a link to development. Yeah, we, we should not separate, although most governments separate humanitarian spending and development spending. They're even often located in entirely different agencies. So we need to bring them together. We need to make, uh, we need to increase the relevance uh, of, of higher education in those contexts. But that also um, is, uh, is a problem of funding and where the funding is coming from. So it takes time to rebuild a higher education system and individual higher education institutions, indeed. And uh, as far as I know, there isn't much literature out there. Uh, that tells us uh, about how to go about it. There isn't much literature at all about the recovery phase in the humanitarian programming cycle, to be very honest. Uh, there is no flexibility in degrees, no short-term certificates or training that would create the kind of relevant skills for a labor market. There's the uncertainty about returning indeed. Oftentimes from the diaspora, those who do return are not always welcome. Uh, and there are several examples I can think of in Somalia, for example, for, uh, for women who have returned and they were not always welcomed. So we need to have that as a discussion topic as well. The fear of returning after persecution. Yes, national policies that don't incentivize resettlement from migrants and those who've been brain drained away. Very, very good. Uh, I think it's a two way, uh, two -way street. Uh, some people, are worried about returning, but then there aren't the right incentives for them to return. And, you know, they have perhaps gotten used to very different systems in their country of resettlement. Um, no flexibility in degrees, uh, none, no availability of short-term programs. Good. Let's take it back to our trio again for the last effort on effects uh, and consequences of the causes that you've mentioned. Maybe uh, we can get started again with uh, Josephine and go around. Uh, you're muted, Josephine. We can't hear you. Could you unmute oh, sorry yourself? Sorry for please? that. I didn't hear no that. worries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the standard yeah. COVID phrases is you are on mute <laughs> or unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Odesim. Uh, I think with uh, the kind of uh, disruption that comes with the provision of higher education, it means there's disruption of capacity building in uh, all sectors of higher education, be it <clears throat> uh, research or innovation or simply problem solving areas, nothing is happening consequently. So, and uh, those who return finally, and this is my second one, those who return back to this country may not be having the skills required to rebuild the nation. And uh, they may actually, we, 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 uh, maybe we don't have any research to show what type of uh, category of skills return home. But more often than not, it is obvious that somebody who had good skills got resettled and is doing well there. And as we have said, may not want to come back. Uh, so we get a nation that actually needs to be trained, retrained, or, right. or starting okay. over again. And, and that leads us to a governance of a nation. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the political governance. I'm thinking about the academic governance. Uh, put it wherever, even in the social cohesion structures, we find leaders who are ill-equipped. And uh, because of politics, you know, who gets to the top, uh, politics determine. How qualified, they may not even have the ground to start looking for skills because they are looking right. for stability, security, and safety at that particular moment. So we find that eventually we have poor governance due to inappropriate skills 
put in positions. And right. uh, I, I think Great, it Josephine. took quite a while, yeah. I'm I'm afraid yeah. we're going to have to kind of close up. Uh, yeah. I think we've we've kind of run out of time, uh, so maybe we can shift uh, to Valerie and then to Jennifer and then uh, also take a last look at the audience contributions. Uh, but I know there are other sessions that are starting. So Valerie, over to you. Yeah. So with the cause of um, skilled workers fleeing the area, then we have. Now, a consequence is that there's like a brain drain. So the workforce um, that is left is now weak and ineffective. And also going back to one of my causes that I mentioned about the lack of opportunities to learn a new skill, this also leads to an unskilled workforce because like other people were saying, there is no um, institutions of allowing people to get short-term certificates or anything to learn a new skill in these areas. And I would like to mention, one more of what people were also mentioning about a fear of returning, especially if you are not welcome, for example, for women. And that consequence of that is uh, the systems of oppression that were kind of already in place before the conflict um, now are perpetuated. Right, right. Yeah, that's a very, very important point. Thank you so much for contributing that. Jennifer, over to you. Uh, two important effects uh, that I wanna highlight. Uh, one is that in the humanitarian emergency response, um, there's an immediacy that uh, that means dependence on external technical experts, which creates, unfortunately, a cycle of reliance on expertise that is not relevant to local needs. So this irrelevant um, uh, external foreign knowledge does not meet local needs and does not prioritize local leaders. The other effect that's related is that there's a generational, I think someone previously mentioned generational loss, generational delay, pause in technical development and knowledge. Again, that needs to be generated by um, the, the local experts building on um, their deep knowledge of uh, their environment. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I, I think just the generational loss and, and the gap that's been created is, is, is particularly uh, uh, difficult. Uh, to close and you know that puts a lot of the onus on the local institutions as well that haven't been able to rebuild. Um, I really would like to thank you I don't think we can go back to the audience contributions, I think our time uh, has run out and there are other sessions that are going to be starting. Um, I really would like to thank the third trio. Uh, for actively discussing uh, the causes and consequences of the problem statement. Uh, and uh, I don't think, you know, there is, uh, I think we've had enough summaries of what uh, uh, we can find on the problem tree, but maybe we can see the finished product. Uh, it is absolutely amazing of uh, how we co-created uh, this tree, how we populated it. Uh, it is so exciting to see. And uh, I know that we still have, uh, you know, a plethora of rich contributions that the audience contributed. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for your dynamic contributions. And uh, I think this session leaves me extremely hopeful uh, as current coordinator of the African Higher Education and Emergencies Network, uh, that we are uh, really moving in the right direction, that there is awareness out there that the audience uh, has contributed so dynamically. And I'll turn it over to Jennifer to finish off the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am blown away by this problem tree that we've co-created, as you said, Barbara, and I'm so grateful for your leadership of this session, for your analysis and your, your thoughtfulness in contributing to this. So thank you to everyone who has been a part of this. And I am very excited to announce that this is not actually going to be the end of this conversation, um, that this is actually just a first step. Um, so the USAID Higher Education Learning Network, the HELEN, will be hosting an online event to discuss more on this topic, address lingering questions, and to begin to generate solutions in this area. So moving beyond our problem tree. Um, so I invite you to join us on Monday, September 26th, which is World Day of Migrants and Refugees, where we will be hosting a workshop entitled Unlocking the Power of Local Solutions, Higher Education in Crisis and Conflict. So to find out more about this event and to register, sign up for the Helen. We'll be sharing out more information on the Helen's uh, listserv and newsletter uh, coming soon. So uh, do join the Helen so you can find out more and continue this conversation.
And so in addition to what we've explored so far in higher education in crisis and conflict affected settings, we know that higher education can play an important role, particularly in those regions experiencing political conflict. Um, and that has significant consequences for democracy and democratic movements. So after our short break, which will happen now, we're gonna tackle this role of higher education uh, in support of democracy and social movements in our next plenary session. So stand up, take a break, stretch, you know, move around a little bit and then come back for this another amazing conversation we're about to have uh, in just 15 minutes. So. Uh, continue the conversation with my colleague Samantha Alvis, and I'll see you back here shortly. Thank you again. <laughs>